I would like to direct your attention today to Romans chapter 10, and we shall read verses 8, 9, and 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now what we believe is a result of our thinking. If we think wrong, we will believe wrong. The word of God is given to us to straighten out our thinking. If our believing is wrong, it's because, as I said, our thinking is wrong. And then our confessing will be wrong. In other words, what we say will be wrong. And it will all hinge on our thinking. Remember Jesus said in Mark the 11th chapter and the 23rd verse, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Ordinarily, we talk quite a bit about the believing part, but we do not talk too much about the saying part. Of course, we shall not be able to say right until we think right. Our thinking has to be in line with the Word of God because actually we shall not be able to believe beyond the knowledge we have of the Word of God. Many people, because of the metaphysical and the mind science religions, will get one mixed up with them because they think that man is just a mental and a physical being. But man is more than this. He is also a spiritual being. Now these advocates have had much to say about the mind until a lot of good Christian people are afraid to say a word about the mind. And yet the word of God has much to say about it. The Bible said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding." The Bible says, casting down imaginations, reasonings, that is, the margin says, and every high thing that uh, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And then the, God's word also said in Romans the 12th chapter and the second verse, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now one renews his mind by studying, feeding upon, and acting on the Word of God. The Word of God teaches him to have the mind of Christ. The only way one can have the mind of Christ is to study His Word believe it in his heart, as we said, and act upon it. The Word of God also teaches him to think, as the Scripture said, on whatsoever things are good, pure, and honest. If there be any virtue in them, and so on, it said, think on these things. And so God's Word does have many things to say about our thinking. We need to realize that thoughts can come into our minds from two different sources. The thoughts that come into our mind do not always originate there. Now the devil from the outside puts many thoughts into our minds. Thoughts come from the outside. And then of course thoughts come from within us, from our spirits into our mind, which are from God. As you stay in close fellowship with the Lord through prayer, meditation, and the study of His Word, you will learn to de determine from whence these thoughts come. Naturally, evil thoughts are from the devil. God is love. You cannot have the spiritual things of God by constantly having foolish talk and participating in the pleasures of this world, even though they themselves are not sins, uh, nor even weights. 
By this pleasure, I mean that a person feels he has to get away from it all on the creek, so to speak, each week or several times a month. The Word does declare that He is the peace of our mind, our strength, our joy, our comfort. Many use all sorts of excuses to do these things regularly, but the truth of the matter is that they really want to do them. In spiritual things, it is all or nothing at all. We must not let even legitimate pleasures absorb all of our leisure time. If one refers to the mind part of the scripture, many misunderstand. Now, if one refers to the believing section, many think they believe, and they do in their minds, but not in their hearts. If one talks about the thinking part, about all many can believe is the negative side of it. Now, there is a negative and a positive side of the subject. The positive side is the more important. The negative side of anything does have its place, but it's not the more important. Then when one mentions confession, most people think of confessing sin, weakness, or failure. Well, now the Bible does say in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the Word of God has much more to say about the positive side of confession than the negative side. If people would see that, it would make a lot of difference in their lives and in their thinking. But they have only heard one side of it preach, mostly the negative. Therefore, they have only exercised the negative side and, uh, you know, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. For instance, the Bible said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, this is not a negative confession. This is a positive confession. That is not a confession of sin, nor is it a confession of weakness. It is confessing him. And it went on to say, And shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is not, I said, a negative confession. It is a positive confession. Christianity is called the great confession. You know, Hebrews, the third chapter, the first verse says, For uh, us to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now, the margin of the Bible reads confession, the high priest of our confession. Now, I think it'll help us at this moment if we define confession. First, it is a, the affirming of something that we believe. Second, it is testifying something that we know. Third, it's witnessing for the truth that we have embraced. Now, one can readily see that confession holds a large place in Christianity because it is affirming something that we believe, testifying of something that we know, and witnessing for a truth that we have embraced. Then it is necessary, as Hebrews 4.14 admonishes, to hold fast our confession. It is necessary that there be a continual confession of redemption from Satan's dominion and of the fact that he no longer rules us with condemnation or fear of disease. We are to hold fast to our confession because our confession is Satan's defeat in our everyday living. Jesus defeated the devil nearly 2,000 years ago at Calvary. But what he did for us legally has to become a vital living reality in our lives. The experimental side of it is the vital side. And, and after all, we shall never understand third of the Word of God until we can see clearly the two different sides of our redemption, the legal and the vital side. Now, the much of the time we pray, God save this man or heal that woman. But we know in the mind of God, he's already healed them and saved them too. In other words, God was in Christ, as the scripture said, reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus doesn't have to die again to save anybody. He's already done that. He doesn't shed his blood anymore. Legally, God has already done it. Now, if one deals with the legal side of redemption and preaches uh, that side only and entirely, then people will not actually experience anything in their lives. That's a great trouble with many of our uh, churches. If one would examine the things he preaches, it is legally true. 
But man has become cold, dead, and formal because he had just preached one side of redemption, the legal side, and it hasn't actually become a vital reality in their lives. Now, on the other hand, if only the vital side, the experience side is preached, then wildfire, fanaticism, and extremism results. There has to be a balance between the two so that one can enjoy vitally, in reality, everything that God legally provided. Now, if one preaches the experience side entirely, he will have people seeking for experiences apart from the Word of God, and that which the Lord has legally purchased, wrought, and provided for us becomes our experimentally, ours experimentally, by our believing the Word of God in our hearts and confessing with our mouths that it is true and that it is ours. Now, I want you to notice that in salvation, Paul, in his writings to the saints, to the Christians at Rome, said, the word of faith which we preach. Now, you see, uh, this cannot be seen in the Old Testament because those people did not have the experience that we have. They did not even see concerning what they had prophesied about. The Bible said they desired to look into them. Uh, we cannot see it in the four Gospels because what Jesus came to bring was not actually available then. He did forgive sins while he was on the earth, but we have more than forgiveness of sins. We are made new creatures. All that he promised, of course, when he was here on the earth and all that the Old Testament prophets had prophesied about did become available unto us after Jesus died, after he was raised from the dead and ascended on high and sat down at the right hand of the Father. The new covenant, the New Testament, was not in force until the high priesthood of the new covenant, the New Testament, began to function. Jesus is the high priest of the New Testament. Now, it's difficult for people to see some things because they have thought, and you see we're talking about right and wrong thinking, that these things were in force while Jesus was here on the earth. But they were not in force. For instance, Jesus had power to forgive sins. But as I said, we have more than just forgiveness of sins. People in the Old Testament had their sins forgiven. But we have more than just forgiveness of sins. We have become new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are born again. Now, if a person, after he's born again, if he does sin, then it said if they confess, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. He is not born again again. Man cannot be born again but once. But he can forgive, be forgiven of his sins many times. Thank God for that. Now here in Hebrews, you know, the, the Word of God said in the 10th chapter, of Hebrews, 23rd verse, let us hold fast the profession, the margin says, the confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, here are two different verses in Hebrews that tell us to hold fast the confession of our faith. One of them is Hebrews 4.14, the other Hebrews 10.23. It is absolutely necessary that we hold fast to affirming what we believe. It is necessary for us to hold fast to a truth that we have embraced. Then again, we go back here to Romans, the 10th chapter, the 9th and 10th verses, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto salvation. Now, uh, the, the uh, people, these people, these very ones he's talking about, heard the word of God preached. It straightened out their thinking and showed them that they were lost, that they were sinners that they could not save themselves, that they could not make themselves righteous, that they could not redeem themselves, but that God sent his Son to this world and condemned sin in the flesh. God made salvation available to us through Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. So the sinner simply says to God, Dear God, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I know according to your word that I cannot make myself righteous, but I thank you because you love me and sent the Lord Jesus to die for me. And through his righteousness, redemption is made available unto me. I believe that he died for my sins according to the scripture. I believe that he was raised from the dead and is my justification. I confess him now and take him as my Savior. I confess him as my Lord. Now, that is thinking in line with the word and believing what the Bible says and confessing it 
creates a reality of salvation in the human spirit. I, I was never satisfied the way some people deal with folks who come to be saved. I, I know a lot of times in, in praying and dealing with folks who come to be saved, we just sort of leave them in the dark, so to speak. Sometimes people tell folks, well, keep on praying, the Lord will save you after a while. But you know, friends, there's more to being saved than just praying. If one prays apart from the Word of God, he will not get anywhere. I've seen so many people come to the altars who were as earnest and sincere as they could be, and yet they went away unsaved. I was greatly disturbed about this. I asked, Lord Jesus, what's the matter? Those that do come to the altar, sometimes only half of them are being saved. Now, I'm sure these that, that uh, didn't seem to be saved are, are just as sincere now, or they wouldn't have come. I know there's nothing wrong with you because you never change. Now, someone suggested there are those that met the conditions and the others did not. But sometimes that's a little too vague. We need to analyze the situation and see why they did not meet the conditions. Did they know what the conditions were? Were they rightly instructed? And so, as I waited before the Lord, he showed me that many times we were not dealing right with the sinner. And then he told me how to deal with him. And so, from that day to this, I have never dealt with a sinner who responded to an altar call and came forward to be saved without his being saved. Not a single one. Sometimes we have a little trouble with some of the backsliders. But I say that every sinner with whom I have dealt has been saved. I've had pastors tell me three or four years after I held a revival in their churches that they never had a single one of my converts to backslide. You see, friends, it makes a great deal of difference as to the basis on which they're brought in. If a sinner's thinking is straightened out uh, to begin with, his believing made right and his confession made right, then it will be much easier for him to stay put, so to speak. If he comes in on the wrong basis, then the devil takes advantage of what he doesn't know and he becomes defeated and robbed of that which God has actually done for him. Of course, if he has been taught the word to hold fast to his confession of faith, naturally the devil will camouflage the situation, try to make him feel he's not saved. And because of little mistakes he makes, the devil will tell him, well, you're done for now. You might as well give up and quit. But you see, when he's been taught right, he'll hold fast to his confession that he is saved. When it comes to healing, the same thing's true. Remember, and that confession is Satan's defeat. Actually, the verse in Hebrews 4.14 said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. I looked this Greek word translated confession up in the Greek concordance, and one translation it reads, that uh, our, our one meaning of it is, let us hold fast to saying the same thing. Now, what does that mean? Well, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. He's there representing us to the Father. He says, I died for them. I took their sins. I redeemed them. I became sin for their sin that they might become the righteousness of God in me. I took their infirmities and bore their sicknesses. I delivered them from the authority of darkness. I recreated them, making them new creatures. That's what he's saying. Uh, and so... Uh, the Greek translation says, let us hold fast to saying the same thing. Now, that's our confession. Your confession will either imprison you or set you free. Confession is the result of our believing. And our believing is the result of our right thinking or our wrong thinking. Now, first, it's necessary that we know what God has wrought for us in Christ and that we believe it and confess it. It is our confession of it that creates the reality of it in our lives, that causes it to become real in our lives. And then second, it's necessary for us to know what God, through the Word and through the Holy Spirit, has wrought in us in the new birth and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And then third, it's necessary for us to know what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing for us now in His present-day ministry at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And then fourth, it's necessary for us to know what the Word of God will do for us through our lips or what God can do. Now, Philippians, the second chapter, the 13th verse said, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in us. God works through us. 
God does not work apart from us. We need to realize that and know that. God gave the church the authority and the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God's plan is to operate through us. The Holy Spirit has been sent uh, to be our helper, and the Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit does not do the work. This thought is another in which our thinking has been wrong. I'm referring to the value of right thinking. Some people said, let the Holy Spirit do it. Let the Holy Ghost do it. Has been the cry uh, of many. The Holy Ghost was not sent to do it. The Greek word translated comforter in the King James translation is also translated helper. You know, another translation said, I will not leave thee helpless. I will come to you. I will send you another helper. And so the Greek word paraclete, that's translated comforter, means one called alongside to help. God did not send the Holy Ghost to us to do the job. He sent him to help us do the job. Too much of the time, the Holy Ghost is left to do it all. If the Holy Ghost does it, then there's no need in our sending missionaries. Let's just send the Holy Ghost over to Africa and let him convert those people. Let's just send the Holy Ghost over to India and let him convert the sinners. Let's just send the Holy Ghost down to South America. Why, why be out all the expense of training and educating missionaries to send to the law if, if, if the Holy Ghost is going to do it? No, friends, the Holy Ghost works through us. He works through the Word in our lips. We pray many times. God convict this person, man or woman, a loved one or a friend. God convict this person of his sins and bring real conviction on him. But you know, conviction will never come on him until someone gives him the word of God. Without hearing the word of God, he will not be convicted. Paul said in Romans the 10th chapter, the 13th and 14th verses, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord uh, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now the Bible said that God ordained that through the preaching of the word or the foolishness of preaching that men should be saved. We certainly believe in signs and wonders, but signs and wonders do not save anyone. They attract people's attention. When their attention is gotten, one then must tell them how to get saved. You know, friends, on the day of Pentecost, 120 people speaking in tongues did not save anybody. Not one was converted until Peter began to preach the word to them. Certainly, we want signs and wonders and miracles, but they alone are not enough. The sinner will not be saved until someone tells him how. Somebody must preach the word to him. If our thinking is right along these lines, our believing will be right. Or if our thinking is not right and is wrong, then our believing will be wrong. Then when our believing is wrong, our talking will be wrong, and we will be confused and defeated. We need to realize what the Word of God can do through our lips because the Holy Ghost is sent to help us. He is our helper. Too much of the time we just get blessed in church and pray, Lord, send the people in. And Lord, you get out and save the people. The truth of the matter is that is our responsibility. We have the Holy Spirit to help us in getting the people into church, to help us to get people saved, to help us do the work of God. Unless we're going to do it, we're wasting all of our time with long hours of praying. I remember a number of years ago, a lady in a certain church uh, in one of our large cities, asked me to pray for her. She said she had fasted and prayed three days and three nights seeking God's will for her life. I asked her what she found out. She said that God wanted her to visit people, to hand out tracts, to do personal work. Well, I told her I could have saved you three days of fasting and praying if you'd asked me, because that's what God expects of all of his children. Now, if you do not see that, and have a desire to witness and work for him, then you're either not saved or else you're a backslidden one or the other. Now, I asked what she wanted me to pray about, and she replied, Well, I want you to pray that I'll do what he wants me to do. I said, No, I won't pray that. You, you see, she knew what God wanted to do. It was up to her to do it. If you know what God wants you to do, and you won't do it, then God have mercy on you. God will not make you do his will. I remember a number of years ago, a man down in East Texas, member of a certain church, he's quite well off financially, but he never paid tithes or supported the church financially. Then one day he saw that the Bible taught tithing, so he stood up in the church and asked that the people pray for him that he would pay his tithes. He said, I see now that it is Bible and it's scriptural. 
Now, he did not need for anyone to pray for him that he would pay tithes. He just needed to obey what he could see that God's word had said. Now, that goes for many things in our lives. You see, I'm talking about right and wrong thinking. If our thinking is wrong, it defeats us. We do not need to turn in prayer requests for some things. If we know what to do, then we should do it. This man didn't need to turn in a prayer request, pray for me that I will pay my tithes. He saw what the word had said. Then all he needed to do is obey it. Actually, the reason that some are asking for prayer in such matters is because that they do not want to do God's word. So they're trying to put the responsibility on God and not on themselves. It's not only what you personally know about the Lord Jesus that counts, but it's what the word of God says you are in Christ that counts. I suggested to a group of people in one church that every single believer prepare a Bible lesson of their own, and if they were ever called upon to speak to some group, they would have more material than they would ever be able to use and could actually be a help and a blessing to the group to whom they spoke. I propose that they read through the New Testament. And I'm proposing this to you, uh, especially the epistles, for their full expression, such as in Christ, in him, and in whom. Now, the, uh, the expression, these expressions, I should say, in Christ, in him, and in whom, are found in the New Testament over a hundred times. Now, there are two more that I add to this list and uh, that do not have that expression, but they infer something we have in him. And you may find some you want to add to the list. Now, in all of these hundred and some odd expressions, they're talking about the individual believer our Christian, about what he does have, not what he's going to get sometime, but what he does have or what he is now in Christ. Many Christians come to me and say, Brother Hagin, I read thus and so in the Bible. I know what the Bible says is true concerning Christians. I know I'm saved and filled with the Spirit, but the promise of the Word does not seem real to me. I then ask them, have you ever acted as if it were real? Have you ever told anyone that it's so? Have you ever confessed it to be so? They many times answered, oh no, I wanted to wait and be sure first. I replied, why? Do you think the Bible lied? The Bible says it's so. Is the Bible a lie? Oh no. But I want it to become a reality within me and then I'll say it. But friends, the text said, with the mouth confession is made unto. A promise must be confessed. That is that it is so before it ever becomes so. That is a reality in your own life. It's true as far as God has said. Now, it's already so according to the word, but the reality or the vital part of it in your life becomes real through your confession with your mouth. I remember one, one day a lady that had been to Sunday school that had been to Bible school, actually, for uh, several years and then had uh, went on to a seminary and received her degrees in education and so on. And she was an educational director in the church where I was ministering. And I taught along this line while I was there. And I made the suggestion that the believers there do as I suggest, go through the New Testament, find these expressions, write them all down in Christ, in him and in whom, and write down both chapter and verse, and then begin to confess that that is so concerning me. Well, about a month later, I went back to the air to preach a fellowship meeting. This lady said to me, Brother Hagin, I did what you said. I've not found all the hundred and some odd scriptures, but I've found 25 of them, written them down, I've meditated upon them, thought upon them, and have begun to confess that they are so concerning me. Now, I've been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost for a good many years. I was raised up in a Christian home, graduated from Bible school, then graduated from a seminary. But you know, I feel as though I've just now been saved. These scriptures are so real that it seems I've just now been born again. Well, I told her the truth of the matter is, uh, or was, that she was born again way back there many years ago when she said she was. But she had never walked in the light of a Christian experience. She had this all along. It was hers. It belonged to her. But she had never dared to confess it and claim it. Therefore, she had never walked in the light of it. She had never enjoyed the reality of it. And so now then, she's beginning to walk in the light of what was hers all the time. When you confess what you are in Christ and walk in it, you are just appropriate the reality of what is legally yours. Now, it's sad to say, friends, that many will never realize this, and they, they, they will remain baby Christians. They will never be able to enjoy the fullness of what they are in Christ because, you see, they read it in the Word, but they don't confess it, and it's with the mouth that confession is made unto. When we confess it, then we enjoy the reality of it. It becomes ours. We've been talking about right and wrong thinking, right and wrong confession, and the value of them. Remember our expressions in him, in whom, and in Christ. They're used, I said in the scriptures, in the New Testament, a hundred and some odd times. And then I added two more scriptures. I want to give these to you. I added uh, these scriptures, uh, Colossians 1, 13, 
It doesn't have the expression in him, in whom are in Christ, but it infers something that we have in him. It says, who, referring to Christ, has delivered us from the authority of darkness. That means the authority of the devil. So that we have in him, as it's implied, we have in him deliverance from the authority of the power of darkness or the authority of the devil. Then I added 1 John 4.4 4 to my list. It says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so I began to confess that the greater one lives in me. Now, you may find some other scriptures that don't have the expression in him, in whom, and in Christ, but they infer something we have. You could add them to your list. And so you could entitle your Bible lesson, uh, Bible Facts, or you could call them In Him Facts, or Redemption Realities, or What I Have in Christ. Now, I remember this, that after I uh, was saved on the bed of affliction and then raised up from the bed of affliction and healed by the power of God, I remember the first time I went to town after I'd been raised up from this bed of affliction, I saw a friend of mine who had been a pal before I became bedfast. We'd grown up together and had played together as youngsters. Now immediately he began to talk of things that we had done before I became a Christian and before I had become bedfast. Now he was laughing and talking about these things and I sat there as though I had a mask on, as though I did not know what he's talking about. Finally he remarked, what's the matter with you? Don't you remember these things? You act as though uh, you don't know what I'm talking about. Well, he went on and uh, talked about another deal we'd pulled and asked, don't you remember that? Well, I replied and answered to him, Lefty, the fella that you was with that night died. He's dead. Well, now he said, I know you nearly died, but you didn't die. Now, I know you, that's you sitting there. I said, uh, all of that to him on purpose to get him stirred up uh, and to get him to think. And then I told him I did not die physically, but after all, it's not just your physical man that does wrong. It's also the man on the inside that gives the body permission to do wrong. My wrongdoing was a result of the spiritual death that was in my spirit, in my heart. There is an inward man. So I reminded him that the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now, I don't have a new physical body, but thank God I'm going to have one someday. Nevertheless, the man on the inside is a new creature, and that old man is gone that used to do those things. There's a new creature there now. You know, a Christian is not just a renovated person, renovated like a mattress is renovated, and made over it, still the same old mattress made over. No, he's a new creature. Uh, this is not a reformation. That this is something that never existed before. A new creature. Praise God. One translation reads, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new species. He's simply something that never existed before. We are not just forgiven sinners. We are not poor, weak, and staggering, barely getting along church members. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't know about you. But this has been my testimony and my confession ever since I was born again in 1933. And I believe, friends, that we need to hold fast to this confession, that we need to think in line of what I'm teaching as Christians and, and believe it and confess it. Now, I've read this truth in some form or another in recent years from the pen of certain writers who've, uh, who've covered the same ground, but I did not receive the revelation from them as I knew it before. I ever read their writings. I saw this as I laid upon the bed of affliction. First, I promised God before I'd ever read the Bible that I would believe and accept whatever he said in his word. And then second, I said I would put into practice, that is, be a doer, not only believe it, but confess it and do it, uh, what he said. And, and you know, I can remember uh, just as a youngster, before I ever began my ministry, well, I guess I was just a young boy preacher, all right, preaching in jail services or on the street or somewhere. And uh, I, I remember this, that many times we would, uh, with other young people, uh, be with them and they would uh, want to do things that's wrong and invite me to do things that was wrong. And I'd just simply tell them, no, I can't do that. And they'd say, well, why? I said, I'm a new creature. They said, you're a what? I said, a new creature. And then I began to preach the Bible to them. And many times, uh, they've gotten under conviction, began to cry. I mean, more times than not, nine times out of ten. I remember even in high school, on, on the school steps sometimes, uh, or in the study hall, I, I preached to them. And, and I, I've seen them come under conviction. Well, you see, friends, 
when we know who we are in Christ and we think in line with that and confess that, it makes a difference in our lives and then it will also convict others. Now, much of the time, we see ourselves as just being saved from sin. And about all we can do is just stagger along down here and continue to live on, barely get along the street, the last house at the end of the block down by Grumble Alley. But thank God that's not true. Ephesians, the first chapter, the seventh and eighth verse says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now notice the expression here, in whom, in whom we have one translation adds the word our redemption. It is in him that we are redeemed. In him we have our redemption. Now I ask the question, from what are we redeemed? Well, now someone will say sin. We are redeemed from sin. Now that's part of the truth, but it's not all of it. And if we just think that far and believe that far and confess that far, then we're going to fall far short of what God has actually provided for us in his great plan of redemption. And actually, just to say it that way, that we're redeemed from sin and leave it at that and imply that that's all there is to it, it's not true. It's not true. We leave the wrong impression. We are in reality redeemed from the thing that made us sinners and made us sin, spiritual death. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. The Bible said, you know, in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now we have to look to the law and find that the punishment for breaking God's law was threefold. Uh, that it was poverty, that it was sickness, and death, that is spiritual death. And of course we have the promise of uh, being redeemed from uh, physical death eventually. Now then, we are redeemed, this scripture said, in whom we have our redemption. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 said, in whom we have our redemption. Through his blood, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, in whom we have redemption, our redemption. Redeemed from what? Sin, well, true, but actually redeemed from spiritual death. Redeemed from the thing that made us sinners made new creatures in Christ Jesus then, redeemed from the power and the authority of the devil, as Colossians 1.13 said, that in him are in referring to Christ, that it says who, referring to Christ, has delivered us from the power of darkness. The power of darkness is the power of the devil or the authority of the devil. So we're redeemed from the power of the devil. Then we're redeemed from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13 said. And the curse of the law is poverty, sickness, and death, spiritual death. Jesus came to redeem us because we were sold into sin and uh, spiritual death with the devil dominating us. But you see, friends, he came to redeem us from the curse of now, that means that if we have redemption in Christ, and we do, then Satan's dominion has been broken. Satan's dominion has been broken. It means that the devil lost dominion over our lives the minute that we were born again and that we became new creatures in Christ Jesus. It means that we have received a new Lord a new master to reign over us. Jesus Christ is our Lord. Satan was our master. He did nominate us. But since we're new creatures in Christ Jesus, we have been born again, and Jesus is our master, and Jesus is our Lord, and Satan has no right to dominate us. Romans, you know, the 6th chapter and the 14th verse says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You know, another translation said, for sin shall not lord it over you. The synonary translation said, for sin shall not lord it over you. Now, if anything lords it over you, it has dominion over you. One could interpret the verse to mean Satan shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Christ has redeemed us. He is our head. He is the head of the church. If he is the head of the church, then he is your head, you see. 
uh, we are members of the body of Christ, then he is our head. Therefore, has the devil any authority to rule the body of Christ? Why no, we know that. We are members of the body of Christ and are to be dominated by Jesus. Satan cannot rule us or he would be ruling the body of Christ, which is the church. Disease and sickness can no longer lord it over us. Old habits can no longer lord it over us. Now why? Because we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. The thing that we need to do is to think in line with God's word, to believe that. Then we begin to confess it. We begin to talk about it. And then it becomes a reality in our spirits. Because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, the Bible said we are made to be overcomers and thus live a victorious life. Now, one can always locate a person spiritually by what he says. The majority of people will quote these scriptures and then pray that they will become real in their lives, not realizing that if they are born again and are in him, that the word is already so. All they have to do is just claim it, reach out and take it. Many asked, if it's so readily obtained, why don't I have it? Now, friends, if you had $10,000 in the bank in your name and you did not know it, you would not be any better off even though it were true or it were yours. And you would be a liar if you said it were not yours. Spiritual things can be yours, but if you don't know it, it will not do you any good. You have to make it yours from the legal standpoint. And uh, uh, not only from the legal standpoint, but from the experimental standpoint. Now, one of my favorite scriptures found in the Old Testament that has helped me through the years is Isaiah 41.10. It says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, I know he said that to Israel, but it is still true concerning us today. Many times we say to people, don't be afraid. There will be a brighter day. Now, you see, that these are human expressions of encouragement. But God says, fear thou not, for I am with thee. That's a good reason not to be afraid. God offers us divine health, divine deliverance. Now, can one know that he is with him and still be afraid? No. If he knows who God is, he cannot be afraid. I know this. Even before I was filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I knew the Bible. I knew faith. And I didn't cry and beg God to help me. I'd open my Bible to Scripture such as this and fall down on my knees before Him and say, Dear God, I'm so glad you are with me, that you are my God, that you strengthen me always and uphold me with the right hand of your righteousness, that I do not have to be afraid, for you told me not to be dismayed. Even the darkest hour, friends, you can go around smiling because you know He's with you and for you and will hold you. It's good to have friends stand with us, with us in faith through our trials. But friends, remember this. The Lord's always with us. He's our help. Now, on the other hand, some are down and out crying, Oh, God, help us. Now, God does help us many times because He's a merciful God and He'll come down to our level. But it's much better to come up to His level for our blessing. When He has to come down to our level, we stay under the gloomy cloud of wrong thinking, so to speak. We feed that cloud of wrong thinking and that kind of feeling by wrong thinking and wrong confession and wrong believing. But we can feed on the Word of God and feed right thinking and feed right confessing and right believing by the Word of God and it will lift us above the cloud of gloom. Romans 8.31 said, If God be for us, who can be against us? Now that should be our confession. God is truly for us. He's not against us. He's always for us. Now, someone said to me, you travel so much, you know, and on the road all the time. Uh, you just pray every minute that the Lord will go with you. I replied, I never pray like that because the word already said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I go before thee. Now, praise God for these promises. We should all become God inside minded. The only way we can become this way is to think God's thoughts after him. Think on what God says in his word and confess that it is true. Amen. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at www.rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.